It's time once again for the Real Pupil Multi-Game Styles here at Mega Tournament. We're still playing 7x7 seven seven Ages in the Pope Lake, but I'm pretty positive that this will be the last time we're in Era 1, which means we're like about an eighth of the way through the game. Pretty exciting. I thought it'd be a good time then to just kind of give a quick uh, brief re-overview, especially since I've made uh, some changes into how the game is played. So basically, 7x7 seven seven Ages is a combination game between 7 Ages, 7 Wonders, and Duel of Ages. Um, how that's combined is, well, how 7 Ages is it, kind of the core of this combination uh, game works is each turn a player assigns one of 7 actions to each of the empires they have in their control. And each player also has a maximum number of empires that they can create. Um, in a 7 player game, that's 3. And I've decided, to even even though I'm playing in the elimination style, um, even when players are eliminated, that three is going to remain. There's only going to be three um, empires per per player, mainly because that's just going to be simpler for me. And I'm I'm fast running out of table space, even with my newish giant table. So each player essentially is going to have between uh, one and three actions they can play. Uh, a turn based on how many empires they have. Those actions are starting an empire, they can do production, they can trade, and production is producing new units, and they can also make forts. Um, they can trade slash progress, which is what they do to progress through time, um, or progress their technology basically. Uh, they can maneuver, which is moving their units on the map. They can destiny, which is discard and redraw cards. And the cards have uh, artifacts, special artifacts, civilizations, and then also special actions that they can do. Um, then they can civilize, which is what they use to, that's the sixth action, which they can use to get more leaders and also to make cities and to put those artifacts on the map. Um, and then finally they can discard an empire. So those are seven actions. Um, during the action selection th uh, thing, I've changed it so that they can assign a Seven Wonders card to one of their empires. So it's like there's a constant um, rotation of Seven Wonders cards. And then when that empire that has the Seven Wonders cards attached to it gets discarded either by losing all its units or by the player choosing the discard empire action, then those card, Seven Wonders cards attached to that unit get recycled back uh, into the next hand of cards. So that's basically the flow of play. So. Um, the Seven Wonders cards uh, have a number of different effects. They kind of they're meant to represent sort of the culture, whereas the Seven Ages actions are more like the government's actions. So there's the cultural kind of like how the people are, and then what the government decides to do with that is sort of what's going on. And then the Duel of Ages stuff it just represents the the leaders and kind of important persona and individuals within those empires. And that's basically how things are going. So if you look at the, the little player areas, and I know it's messy, it's it's going to get cleaner as people get eliminated. Um, that's one of the benefits of death. Uh, you can you can see I've, uh, we have our empire, that's this card here, and then the seven ages cards that are attached to it. Now there's, there's four basic types of cards. There's resource cards, which are brown and gray. There's science cards. Um, there's blue cards, which give you wreaths, and then there's yellow commercial cards. Um, the science cards, if you have the, the highest science score, which currently is actually not flush anymore, flush is Syracusians. Syracusians have four, because um, there's two tablets, so it's two times two, they have four. Um, Runt actually has the most. She has seven, because she has one of each type for the Amazons. So the Amazons get a free progression at the end of the turn. Is basically whoever has the highest science score gets that. Otherwise, they only can progress through trade, the tr trade progress action, um, and that's that's something that's purely seven by seven ages. In seven ages, everyone gets to progress. Uh, the wreaths, those those um, decide whether or not you can use a special event on someone or not. Because there's all these kind of like godlike powers, like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and stuff. So if um, the Syracusians, for example, had chosen civilized action, which is when you get to play those. They can, they could do volcanic eruption if they had that card in their hand of cards, which they might. I don't know that they do. 
doesn't look like they do, but oh, okay, corrupt administration. They could play corrupt administration on someone who has fewer amount of wreaths than them. So they have three, so they could play it on, is there anyone who has fewer than them? Uh, the Harappans. I guess they could play it on the Harappans and the Phronic Egyptians and the Amazons would be the only ones who are less than three. So that's what those do. Um, the trade cards, beyond their seven wonders effect, they add to their trade rating. Uh, higher trade rating, when you do the trade progress action, makes it so that you get a free progression. I decided everyone gets to progress when they trade, but if you have the higher, higher number, then you also get to progress again. Um, and that, yeah, there's also these army things. If you have a higher army rating, you get a bonus in, in battle and you get to play events for your side. So we're beginning with Start Empire. The only person who's eligible to do that right now is Little Red, and he is opting not to. He actually has some Era 1 Empires, but he wants to wait until he can play some Era 2 Empires just because he doesn't want to get stuck with a, a weak Empire at this point. Uh, Little Red's in bad straits, though. He was scoring off the Chow here. Chow, yeah. Uh, but the Chow's land is getting infringed upon by two fresh empires, so he's got he's to come up with something fast. And we're now at the production phase. Uh, Little Red got to do that. Uh, he's our first turn player, and he did a time wrinkle on production, so production's actually going to be happening twice, and he used that to, to greatly bolster his defensive position. So he, did, he used two production actions. The first one, he put forts in all his spaces. There are five a thing. They add two to the, the difficulty of taking that, basically. Um, and then he used the second one to get a bunch of units. So now he's all outfitted out and ready to defend himself from the, the um, interlopers. Everyone else is going to get another production action, however, too, who also chose production. Pretty safe mo move for him, though, um, because the, the free state here of Kaz and the Chin of of um, flesh, it's very unlikely they would choose production because of the the maintenance cost of units there. So how production works is you you get money based on what you have. So uh, you know if flesh had done production right now, he'd get two from the mountains, one from the city, and then he'd have to spend five <laughs> to you know to pay for his units. So there's really it's really no reason for him to choose production at this point. We're in the maneuver phase, and as you might recall, there's this situation developing between Little Red's Chow's, um, cat, as in cat's, free state, and um, Flush's chins, chins, right there. Now, uh, Flush is already gone, and he opted not to go after Little Red. Little Red built up so much with that double production that he just felt like it was worth it to kind of bide his time and try and take the the unoccupied areas of China. Um, Ka, however, is a little more desperate, being in last place and not seeing, you know, having the, the unit limit. She's not able to um, recruit any horses or boats with the Free State, so she's pretty much stuck with just the pikemen and the archers until, I guess, until here, <laughs> and that's a long ways away, you know, a, a lot of progress she needs to make before she can do that. Um, so that's that's a problem. You know, I should, yeah, um, she could always trade, I think, and get the capability of, of having horses and boats, but in, in any case, she, she feels like she needs to hurry, and so she's got a one-to-one a -one chance, actually, on this. She sent in enough forces that she may be able to take this. If she can't take it, that's going to be worth uh, some points to her which is what she needs right now. Otherwise, she's going to be falling behind flush pretty quick. All right, so it's a one-to-one. -one. That's gonna be, She's pretty much flipping a coin here to see if she wins or not. Uh, even if she does, she's going to be in kind of a weak condition. But this is what she feels she needs to do. Two, that's not a good roll if I recall. Two, that means three-fourths of the attacker are lost. Oh. So the upshot is everyone died. Um, all of the attacking forces died, and then three-fourths of that had to die of the defenders, which was actually three. So three-fourths of four is three. All Everyone died. All right, and we have finished the turn. 
Uh, Kat is still, uh, she's fallen further and further behind. She's only scoring a point off the free states one week. If her gambit had paid off, she'd be getting two points, which is still one less than what Flush is pulling in. Not very good. Things are also not looking so great for Cowboy. Cowboy um, lost his, uh, Milky moving in here caused Cowboy to lose his, his chance at the water for right now. He might be able to uh, build back up and get in there, but... Um, he kind of ha had the same sort of problem as Cat and throwing so many forces at at, uh, at someone else that those suicide attacks, they just don't work out. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, Milky did come back and take take back this land that, that Cowboy got rid of. Uh, so Cowboy's turn was basically a production and then a very small maneuver. He was hoping to, to jump in over here with the, the Phoenicians, but... Milky got to go in first and take it from him. So this kind of area, everyone's just kind of button heads and it's hard for them to move. Runt still is in a great position. I mean, she has Africa pretty much to herself, although Flush is coming in. Uh, Flush really needs to be able to mobilize a little bit better though. Uh, once he can do that, he, sh he could be scoring pretty well. Um, what else? Things are still looking nice for Giraffe. Giraffe and, and Runt are, have kind of pretty smooth sailing. Cat is definitely flagging the most, followed by probably Cowboy. And Little Red is also in a rough shape. But um, that that, abil that uh, double production action really saved him. <laughs> he would have been in trouble. Um, after I did the double production, I, I read it a little closer. And I guess that wasn't supposed. the second production wasn't supposed to happen until the end of the turn. But, you know, that's the way I played it, and I played it that way for everyone, so I think it's okay. Forgot to mention, we're in era two now. Uh, Front got her free advance at the end of the turn, so that is going to open up, as I've said many, many times, the number of choices that people have for the empires they are going to begin. All right, we've started another round, and Little Red has finally started another empire, the Chams. He, uh... The Chams are located in Champa, and they're kind of like um, the Chower and the Harappans in that they kind of have their own little nook. Their nook is closer to some other nooks, China and India, but basically if they have the most in Southeast Asia, they're going to get some points. So they're also a, a trade-oriented nation, so he or empire. So if he can have a lot of money, that's helpful too. Uh, but that's that's probably going to save him, I think, from, from defeat. He wasn't doing too bad, actually. He was about in the middle of the pack, but starting to slip. Uh, that double production definitely helped Little Red hold on there. And I think he's going to actually even be able to regain some territory because, I mean, Kaz in no place to get that, that space. The trade in progress action... Um, with this way of playing with the science cards being the only way you get the free progress, really um, really is a lot more attractive. Uh, Giraffe just pulled ahead with that, with her Harappans, uh, just, by, just by trading a lot. It helps that she's not in really conflict with anyone, so she can feel um, comfortable trading. She might get into conflict soon, though. Her borders are up against uh, flushes here. Um, definitely not at the point where either of them wants to attack the other. Being in the mountains makes it less likely to want to attack because of that mountainous defensive bonus. Flush and Runt have both been making big moves. Runt is just spreading out with her her people. No real conflict there. She's just she's just taking land. Um, no one else is in the Central Europe area, and so she's just taking it. Flush, however, he is uh, being combative. Uh, which is something Flush is fairly good at. Um, and partly because he can back it up. I mean, not only is he sending Jade the Unicorn, who is one of his leaders, to go take on Beowulf over here, uh, right by this um, labyrinth. I should talk about the labyrinths real quick. Uh, I will do that in a second. But he's also sending a huge army over to Spain here, uh, Andalusia, to, to take some ground from Kaz and Kat. That might be the nail in her coffin. That's that's really rough. She's finally she finally has the capability of, of making boats, however, so that should be good for her. Um, but she hasn't made them yet. She should have been able to make them this turn, but she decided to do her production action with uh, the free states instead. If you do the same, same action twice with two empires, this is a fun fact about this game. 
because you can do that with the wild card action, um, you lose a glory point, and she really can't. She doesn't feel like she can afford to do that right now. So anyway, Flush is invading Spain, taking over um, Western Africa, and he's sending this unicorn to fight Beowulf. So we're going to get to try a new part of the game we haven't done yet, which is the tactical leader battle. It's going to be Jade Unicorn versus Beowulf right now. Okay, so here we have it all set up. I'm just setting up on the floor. I have another game set up on my little table, and this shouldn't take too long. It's not something I should need to leave uh, set up. I almost just uh, just rolled this out because I figured they're both just kind of melee characters and they can just fight it out, but then I realized uh, there is some movement difference. Uh, Beowulf doesn't really want to be in this fight. Uh, yeah, it, it could actually be either of them, though, who win. Let's take a look at them side by side. So we see this here. That's how easy it is for them to hit. closer they are to white, the better. So Beowulf's better at hitting, right? But then if you look at their damage, that's going to be compared against their armor, right? So uh, uh, basically, Duel of Ages, the closer you are, the closer you are to red or black, the worse a stat is in terms of, of things. Um, the closer you are to white, the better. So yellow, white is better than yellow, but yellow is definitely better than blue, okay? So if we look here, Beowulf does a lot of damage with that four, but the penetration is less than the blue, so the chances of his damage actually getting through fully are low. However, you know, unless he gets a, a bad roll, really bad roll, some damage is going to get through in every hit. If we look at uh, Jade the Unicorn, Jade the Unicorn is going to penetrate almost every time and probably get bonus damage for getting good rolls. However, it's not as much damage, so it should be interesting. Um, Jade the Unicorn is a lot faster, um, but Jade the Unicorn also has some problems in Swamp, Woods, and Rough. Yeah, there's a lot larger movement costs. So here's our, our map here. This is the closest thing I could find to the terrain on the map, um, Siraneka. Uh, if someone actually controls the terrain, they can decide the platter, but no one controls this terrain, so I just kind of picked what I thought was best. Um, Beowulf can can win, can get out of the fight by getting across to this side um, and exiting the map on that side, or either can you know win by by just killing the other. Um, if Jade Unicorn gets across, say, to this side here, Jade Unicorn will win. So, I'll go ahead and start playing and I'll come back and check in if something fascinating is happening. Here are our first moves here. Interesting movement so far. You can see how they're going. Uh, Jade the Unicorn's having to stay through the river for the most part, uh, which still costs two, two movement as opposed to one or seven. Um, Beowulf's like sticking to the woods and kind of, they're, they're, they're kind of neck and neck really. Unfortunately for Beowulf, he's got to get out over here, I believe. And so he's gonna, I think, gonna have to get through the unicorn, we'll see. And Beowulf was able to escape without confrontation. It was a pretty fun little chase, fun little game. All right, now it's time for Flush's Assault on Andalusia. We're going to be using this column here. It's actually a 9 to 1 ratio, but this is the, the best he can get is the 4 to 1. Anything other than a 1 and he's good. Does he, he might have a military advantage, actually. Nope. Uh, no, where's Cat? Yeah, sorry. I keep I was thinking about Run. Okay, so if he doesn't get a 1, it's going to be a wipeout. And he doesn't get a 1, so he is... Got a pretty strong foothold in here, and there we go. So this is a good time to take a look at Flesh's card. All of this world conquering is actually not really worth any points to him. Um, taking the water is, so this is purely just taking other people down right now. Um, pretty smart in the, in the case of Kath, really. I mean, if she if she loses, then he doesn't lose. Right, giraffes Romans have made their move into the central Mediterranean. Uh, Flesh has a boat there. She's going to try and get his boat there. She could have gone to the western Mediterranean and attacked. Oh no, actually, I forgot that boat is not in the western Mediterranean. It's in Corsica. Never mind. So attacking that boat there. She could have gone to the western Mediterranean and just taken the ocean. But I think she just she liked the central Mediterranean better for strategic purposes. Two to one. Two. 
everything, he loses everything, and she loses everything he lost. So she's going to lose one, he's going to lose one. That seems to be a, a common result with on that table. The Chi'in are doing a civilized action on behalf of flesh. This is not notable because we don't do a lot of civilized action, so you might wonder, what's the point of these wreaths? Well, the wreaths uh, can be very powerful during the civilized action. For example, uh, flesh was able to create an equine fever in this space here. He could have done it on any space on the board that had fewer wreath, had an empire of few, fewer wreaths in them. That wiped out all the horses there, which was all the units there, uh, which made it so that Little Red lost his capital. Um, so that's going to cause him to lose all of his money, I do believe. Um, and what that also does is that makes it so that the Chin are going to have the majority in China this turn uh, because that was that took Little Red down a space. Flesh is next in the turn order from Runt, who is our turn leader this turn. If there's a tie, generally, if there's not any philosophers. Um, well, wait, does he have a philosopher? No, that doesn't work because he has Prince Waller Blatt, so he's still going to win the tie. Never mind. But it's still damaging. What else did he do? He did something else. He got a silver mine. And, oh, he, he hit he hit Giraffe's Romans. He got rid of their Great Pyramids, which knocked the Romans back in age. Not huge, but something. Aha, but Clever Flesh was also able to get a leader this turn, and he could choose between Shi and Sun Tzu. He chose Sun Tzu because Sun Tzu is a philosopher as well, so that is going to give him the glory point. Uh, Flesh is not at the back anymore. He's still got a good lead on Ka. But he doesn't want to take any chances. He doesn't want to get eliminated from the game. He would really like to come out on top in the real people multi-game solitaire mega tournament. So he has Sun Tzu, who's also Sven the Netminder. That's going to be an interesting um, combination. Let's see. Sun Tzu, he wrote The Art of War, correct? I think I have that book. I haven't read it yet. Um, but it's right here. Found it at the Goodwill. Um, interesting connect this this is maybe a young uh Sun Tzu. Sven the Netminder is a is the young hero. He starts off um with all these gray stats and they get defined as time goes on. A lot more bookkeeping for me to have <laughs> this like one guy who I have to keep track of a lot more. A lot of times I don't have to think so much about the leaders. But you know this is this is the check I wrote and now I gotta cash it. Melky also just attempted to wreak some destruction, some havoc on the world. He was successful in most cases, but not in all. Uh, first thing he did is he got rid of all of the Chin's money. That serves a couple purposes. One that hurts Flush. You know, Flush is a young upstart, a young up and comer, um, guiding his empires across the map um, and up the glory track. Also, the Babylonians who are doing the civilized action they score on having the most money. So Flush's Chin were had the most money at that time, so now getting rid of them, that gives him the second most money. He's actually uh, just behind the Minoans, which is his other people. So he's going to want the Minoans to have less money so that. And then his Babylonians will be able to score off that. Uh, then he did an earthquake, massive earthquake, hit Giraffe. Giraffe hasn't been hit much by anyone, um, which is good in real life, but in, in game terms, it's 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 allowed her to creep up on Melky here, and you know, she's the next next person. Her Indian, uh, her Rappins have been untouched. I was going to say relatively untouched, but they've been untouched. No one's done anything to them. Uh, so he got them and then hit Flush also in the process. Uh, big earthquake, destroyed some cities, put some disorder down there. Disorder basically means you... Um, you can't collect money off of that, those lands, which is not good for your government, right? Because you, you need to be able to get money in order to produce more military units. Cowboy has sort of just done Melky a favor, but also done himself a favor. He, he successfully wiped the Minoans off the map just via um, natural disasters. First, he put a pestilence on the eastern Mediterranean. Um, the disease quickly ate through uh, Melky's Minoan ships there. And then he had a, a volcano erupt in Crete, which destroyed the remainder of Melky's Minoan units. Um, so these are all going to be gone. 
And I'd, I'm not going to compensate Milky for that. I compensated people before when they lost all their cards just for losing one empire. But I think if you have cards, you know, with this new format where I have the cards assigned to empires, I think it's a little more even in a way. Um, yeah, before, Cowboy couldn't have done that in the way uh, when, when the cards were, were global. For, for one's empires, but since they're assigned now, the Minoans have no wreaths to protect them, so the gods are not happy, and so, well, they're not unhappy, but, you know, if, um, if, if cowboys people who have these wonderful statues uh, just ask the gods to take care of the Minoans, they'll, they're going to do it because the Minoans have it, don't have any statues. All right, and there you have it for the turn. Um, Melky our leader through most of the game so far only pulled in two glory points this, that turn that's not very much as, as a comparison that's how much people like little red who have very little uh, pulled in cat as in cat only pulled in one she's got to do something to turn things around or she's going to be in trouble um we see uh flush here is starting to overtake cowboy and little red in terms of points but he's still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points ahead of Kaz and Cat. She has a lot to make up and not a lot of point capabilities. I mean, these this pirate state here, which is arguably her strongest state she has going, with these two er areas here, uh, the most it can make is two, and then you know some some bonus points here and there for uh, winning sea battles. The free state it has a bit, you know, if it if it could if, if she if she could dominate this Asian area, this Chinese area, she could she could get three points out of that, and then you know if she could expand further, she could get more with the world. They have the they have the potential to score big, but she's not in a good spot for it. A lot of competition there, though they are kind of weakening each other, right? We're seeing little red is kind of weakening, definitely. So maybe she can do something, but it might be better if she could start a new empire. She's going to have to make some decisions based on that. But not a lot of time left. If we look at our progress track, one, two, three, four, four turns, it's going to be really, really hard for her to catch up. Uh, she's got to be hoping that one of these three, something bad happens to them. Um, possibly Little Red, maybe Cowboy. I don't know, neither are in the best straights. Um, Flesh has pissed a lot of people off, so maybe things will go bad for him. Uh, we'll have to find out next time on the Real People Multigame Solitaire Mega Tournament, Pope Leg, not Animal Farm, 7x7 seven seven Ages.